The man realizes that he is sleeping by the seaside, and there is a hole in his hand. However, he doesn't feel any pain. The man examines the rest of his body, and there is also a hole in his chest. He rushes to the hospital for medical help. After the examination, the man has no heartbeat. Dr. Jin speaks. Based on the examination results, this patient, it seems like you are already dead. After Dr. Jin finishes speaking, he wants to take a sample from the wound to study this medical miracle. The man pushes him away and runs out of the hospital. At this moment, no one can predict that this man will cause a corpse transformation. Time last night, this man named Fick is a police officer who is currently going through a divorce with his wife. The discord in his family has made him focus on his career. Vic wants to get information from the Mafia, so he disguises himself as a corrupt police officer. After much effort, he manages to establish a good relationship with the Mafia. That night, he was walking his dog by the seaside with the purpose of exchanging information with the Mafia member Eric. Eric buys information from the police, and Vic overhears the location of the exchange. After the exchange, both parties prepare to go home. When Vic stumbles upon a murder scene, a masked man named Lu Di is in the act of committing the crime. Vic fires his gun to warn him, and then chases after him. Louis hides behind a pillar and ambushes him. He knocks Vic down with the gun's buttstock. Immediately after, he raises his handgun. Vic instinctively reaches out his hand to stop him, and the bullet passes through his palm, hitting his chest. Louis throws the body and the police gun into the sea and leaves. That's why Vic wakes up by the seaside and discovers two holes on his body. He returns home and uses tweezers to remove the bullet from his chest. Dick's mind is in turmoil. He decides to report what happened last night. After the police receive the report, they set up a police cordon on the bridge where the incident occurred and conduct a detailed investigation. They don't find any clues, but a witness claims that they heard a noise on the bridge last night. Max comes over to help Vic with the statement. That's when he finds out Vic lost his service weapon. Vic has a drinking habit and is unreliable, so his colleagues are somewhat suspicious, thinking he lost the gun due to being drunk. The lies he tells, Vic guessed what Max and the others were thinking, and he inserted the extracted bullet into a gap in the bridge, and then pretended to discover a clue, calling the forensic team to collect evidence. With this crucial evidence, the issue of the service weapon finally came to a close. That night, Max, based on the clues provided by Vic, ambushed the location where Eric was preparing for the exchange. When the time came, the other party indeed showed up. While Eric was preparing to transfer the goods, the police rushed in to apprehend him. They caught him red-handed. Surprisingly, Eric managed to escape in the chaos. On the other side, Vic was having dinner with his family. For some reason, he constantly felt very hungry. He kept stuffing food into his mouth. His exaggerated manner of eating caught the attention of his family. And while Vic was eating, he suddenly spewed out a mouthful. His wife felt disgusted, which further solidified her decision to divorce him. In the evening, his little daughter came to comfort him. Vic felt very happy. He reached out his arm to hug his daughter. The feeling of hunger struck again. He tightened his arm, causing the little girl to scream in pain. Vic quickly let go. This can go on like this. He contacts Dr. Din. After listening to Vic's transformation, he also doesn't understand. He expresses his willingness to provide assistance, but Vic can let anyone else know about this. Otherwise, the government will capture him and use him as a research subject. After Dr. Jin finishes speaking, he takes Vic to his secret laboratory. Dr. Jin is still a scientist. Dr. Jin suggests that Vic lives with him so that he can observe him 24 hours a day. But Vic thinks of his family. He can move out. Otherwise, he won't be able to save his marriage. So, Vic refuses Dr. Jin's proposal. Just then, his friend Amanda calls. She wants Vic to come and save her. She is a debt-ridden escort. Did Eric use money to buy information from Vic? That money, Vic gave it to the escort. He rushes to the red light district, where Amanda has overdosed and collapsed on the ground. Vic goes to the side and pours water for her. Eric pops up and questions Vic. Why didn't you inform the police in advance about the operation? Vic tries to deceive his way out. Eric stabs him in the back with a knife. Vic forcefully pulls out the knife. He doesn't feel any pain. Instead, he feels a familiar hunger sensation rushing in. Vic's eyes turn black and his veins bulge. He lunges at Eric and keeps biting him. Eric struggles to free himself from Vic. Eric runs to a nearby bar. The bar owner sees his bloodied arm. He takes out a first aid kit, tells Eric to go to the restroom and bandage himself up. As Eric leaves, the bar owner immediately makes a call to the Mafia. 
This Eric didn't get information from the police. The boss lost both a valuable person and money. So naturally, there will be consequences. Several henchmen stab Eric to death and dispose of the body in a garbage dump outside the city. On the other hand, Vic arrives at the seaside. He suddenly feels an itch in his palm. He unwraps the gauze and inspects it. The holes on it have miraculously healed. Vic is delighted. Although he doesn't know where this ability comes from, it's still better than dying in the sea. Meanwhile, the masked killer from that night has targeted a new prey. He approaches an elderly man who is fast asleep, but doesn't harm him. Instead, he hides a pinhole camera in the ceiling lamp. The masked killer returns to his car and takes off his mask. Surprisingly, the person is Dr. Dean on Vic's side. Although the wound in his palm has healed, his body's abnormalities are getting worse, constantly emitting a foul odor. He has been thinking about Louis' case all night, but there are no leads. His daughter brings out a suspect sketch drawn by Vic. She claims to have seen this mask before. Vic goes to the art gallery with his daughter. They find a painting on the wall, depicting a person who bears a strong resemblance to Louis. He takes the information about the artwork to his superior, Helen, hoping that she will investigate it thoroughly. However, Helen tells Vic to go home and take a shower, as the smell coming from him is unbearable. Vic's nose can detect the foul odor, but he still goes home and takes a shower. He discovers that the hole in his chest is festering, with maggots wriggling inside. This terrifies Vic, and he immediately goes to see Dr. Jin for an examination. While Dr. Jin is taking a sample from the wound, Vic once again feels a familiar hunger, but he quickly regains his composure. Dr. Jin explains that Vic's organs are decaying, so he prescribes a bottle of preservative liquid, which not only masks the odor, but also slows down the decay process. However, in order to maintain his physical condition, Vic is advised to stay in a cold environment. Apart from this, unlike the deteriorating organs and cells, Vic's brain is still functioning healthily. If all the organs die, the brain will eliminate those functions. By that time, not only his sense of smell, but his other senses will also fail. Therefore, Dr. Jin suggests living together again, but Vic doesn't want to become an experiment. He leaves the hospital, while Dr. Jin goes to a secret laboratory. There it is a corpse soaking in a glass case, and it is the victim he killed on the bridge. After Vic leaves the hospital, he arrives at a sanatorium. His seriously ill father is recuperating there, and his wife, Isa, works as a nurse at the sanatorium. She takes care of his father diligently. Vic rarely visits the elderly man. He promised his wife that he would come today, only to discover Isa embracing the doctor. Could it be that Isa's dating partner is the doctor from the sanatorium? Vic leaves the place and seeks comfort from a call girl. He doesn't return home until evening, where his wife is on the phone with her new boyfriend. Isa had already mentioned to Vic that she was dating someone else, but Vic never wanted to believe it. After Isa leaves, he picks up the phone, wanting to see the contact information of that man. Suddenly, his son returns home, so Vic quickly puts the phone in his pocket. It's dinner time. The family of four is incredibly silent, especially Vic, who has no appetite at all. After the children leave the restaurant, Isa questions Vic why he didn't visit his father. Vic's father's condition is very serious. He could pass away at any moment. Isa also thought about this, which is why she postponed the divorce matter. The elderly man has always hoped to see his son before he dies. Faced with his wife's accusations, Vic doesn't provide an explanation. He still hopes to persuade Isa to change her mind. In the evening, Vic's hole in his palm resurfaces. He decides to sleep in the freezer. Since he can't feel cold or hot, sleeping inside will also keep him fresh. When all the family members have left during the day, Vic climbs out of the freezer. A long-haired man named Jesse approaches silently, holding an iron rod. Alert, Vic swiftly turns around. A bloodthirsty desire instantly consumes his rationality. Vic lunges at the man and bites him. After he comes down, he starts cleaning up the scene, washing off the blood stains. Vic stuffs the body into the trunk, preparing to dispose of it. Unexpectedly, Max appears and sits in the passenger seat. Only then does Vic remember that he has a mission today. He needs to investigate the smuggling group Eric belongs to with Max. Vic can only drive. The two wanted to use the wife of the prisoner to find the hideout of the criminal group. They followed each other's vehicles, leading them to a nearby abandoned factory. Because Vic had contact with criminal groups as an undercover agent, to prevent exposure, Max decides to get out of the car and investigate alone. Vic stays in the car and waits. He wants to take out his phone and check, but instead, he finds his wife's phone. Vic opens the call history and dials the suspicious number. He wants to know, is the person his wife is dating a nursing home doctor? 
Surprisingly, the call goes to Max's voicemail. Vic is extremely shocked. Has he been betrayed by his colleague? Before he can recover from the shock, he hears strange noises coming from the trunk. Vic gets out of the car to investigate, and discovers that the bin to death Jesse has come back to life. If Max finds out, it won't end well. Vic grabs a fire extinguisher and knocks out Jesse. After Max returns to the car, he takes out his phone and texts Issa. He wanted to explain that he didn't answer the phone because of work. Unexpectedly, Vic's pocket receives a text notification. Max finds it strange, and there's a thumping sound from the trunk. Startled, Vic slams on the brake. He explains that it might be some loose parts, but Max insists on checking it out. Just as he's about to open the trunk, Vic steps on the gas and speeds away. When Max returns home, Issa happens to come for a visit. Max asks her if she saw the text. Issa explains that she lost her phone. Max realizes that Issa's phone might be with Vic. It seems like he discovered their relationship. On the other hand, Vic has no intention of causing trouble for Max. He needs to deal with the issue in the trunk first. The revived Jesse pleads incessantly. He explains that he was instructed to kidnap Vic. In order to reveal who the mastermind is, Vic instructs Jesse to contact the person, arranging a meeting with them on a ship at the dock. Turns out the mastermind is Dr. Kim, but he didn't show up. Instead, he accessed the surveillance hidden on the ship. Dr. Kim sees Vic in the footage and realizes Jesse's mission has failed. Immediately after, Vic also discovers the cameras. It seems the mastermind won't show up. So, what should be done with Jesse now? Vic suddenly comes up with a brilliant idea. He directly hands over Jesse to Dr. Kim. Do you want a test subject? This guy also came back to life. He can be used as an experiment. After dealing with Jesse, Vic returns home and goes to sleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night feeling cold. Why would he feel cold? Vic looks down and notices the gunshot wounds on his chest are gone. Before the two holes disappeared, Vic had engaged in biting behavior. Combining this fact, it's not difficult to guess that eating meat helps sustain his physical condition. Vic gets dressed and follows his wife. He saw her making out with Max. He suppresses the rage in his heart and continues to stick out near the factory with Max. Meanwhile, Max thinks that everything has been exposed, so he confesses to Vic about his serious relationship with Isa. In fact, Vic has no grounds to blame them. If it weren't for his father's poor health, Isa would have divorced and moved out long ago. Just then, a curly-haired woman named Kate from the factory steps out. They quickly start following her in the car, and they discover a suspicious bloodstain along with Kate. As evening falls, Kate goes to a self-service car wash. Unexpectedly, something suddenly strangled her. By the time the car slid out of the car wash, Kate inside had already disappeared, leaving behind a car full of blood. After receiving the report, the police immediately arrived at the scene. They suspected that there had been an internal conflict within a gang, but the methods were excessively brutal. Just then, Helen calls out to Vic. She says the forensic department conducted a ballistics analysis and found that the position of the bullet from earlier on the bridge was incorrect. She is not sure what Vic has been hiding, but if they don't catch Louis and find the victim, this matter will not be resolved. On the other side, Dr. Jin is studying Jesse, although he was bitten off half of his body by Vic, but he is still alive and well and can eat well. This voracious symptom is the same as Vic's previous condition, which means zombification can spread through biting. While Jesse was eating, he vomited all over Dr. Jin. Dr. Jin went outside to change his clothes, and his little daughter noticed that the laboratory door was unlocked. She actually went inside, and she saw Jesse locked in a cage. She didn't scream in fright. Jesse pleads for her to hand over the key. Just as the girl is about to reach out her hand, Jesse suddenly goes berserk. Dr. Jin appears just in time to protect his daughter and sends her upstairs. Dr. Jin doesn't forget to brainwash his daughter, saying that he is helping a sick uncle. In the evening, Vic comes over to inquire about the progress of the research. Dr. Jin expresses that the reason Vic's wounds healed, it's because he ate a lot of living cells while infected with a certain virus, therefore it has a strong regenerative ability. As for whether his normal heartbeat can be restored, further in-depth research is required. As Vic hasn't eaten anything for a while, the wounds on his palms and chest have started to deteriorate again. Vic quickly applies preservative oil to his body, but this only provides temporary relief. A mouse scurries out from the cupboard. Vic thinks to himself that this should also be considered live cells, and he pounces on the mouse and starts gnawing on it. Unfortunately, the meat of animals doesn't have an effect. On the other side, Jesse is also starving to death. 
in order to ensure that the experimental subjects are alive. Dr. Din he sneaks into the house of an elderly person who lives alone and uses a handkerchief and a sedative to render them unconscious, and proceeds to dismantle the cameras in the room and takes the old person away in his car. From this, it can be seen that Dr. Jin installs cameras for surveillance in chosen prey's homes to monitor them. Just as he parks the car downstairs, he encounters Vic coming to visit Jesse. Dr. Jin can only leave the old lady in the car and accompanies Vic back to the laboratory. Little did they know they missed the final feeding time. Jesse starved to death. Dr. Jin feels a wave of regret. Just then, Vic receives a phone call. He learns that something is happening at the factory. Max has already arrived there first. As soon as he enters the room, he sees a large pool of blood on the floor and a bin corpse lying on the ground. Then, a man appears and knocks Max unconscious. When Vic arrives at the factory, all he sees is an unconscious Max. The next second, the man walks out. Vic realizes it's Eric. Turns out he didn't die in the garbage dump. Eric, because he was bitten by Vic, has also turned into a zombie. And he has learned it, that eating humans is the secret to preserving his body from decay. Thus, Eric found the several henchmen who tried to kill him and ate them directly. Kate's death and that pool of unidentified blood were all Eric's doing. Now, he proposes a collaboration with Vic. We can expand and strengthen our human trafficking business, not only making money, but also solve the food shortage problem. To demonstrate his sincerity, he suggests that Vic should eat Max. Faced with such a fresh temptation of flesh and blood, Vic seems to struggle. But the next moment, he turns around and lunges at Eric. The two of them instantly engage in a fight. Eric knocks him down with a punch. However, Vic manages to pick up the handgun from the ground. Taking advantage of the chaos, Eric climbs over the wall and escapes the factory. The police quickly surround the scene. Vic takes Max to the hospital for treatment. The corpse that was bitten to death inside the factory is also transported back to the police station. Max regains consciousness. His female superior, Helen, asks him if he saw the killer. Max couldn't see the killer's face clearly because Eric was wearing a helmet, so he couldn't make out his appearance. Vic, in order to prevent his own transformation from being exposed, describes the killer as approximately six feet tall and physically strong. However, the autopsy results still raise many doubts. As the victim's body is covered in bite marks, Vic tried to trick him with a wild dog bite, but the forensic expert is not a fool. It's evident that the wounds are from human teeth, and the gunshot wound to the head is also suspicious. The killer had already been the person to death, so why shoot him in the head? Among the people pressed, only Vic knows the reason, because only a shot to the head can completely kill an infected person. Helen quickly holds a press conference, where she announces that all beaches will have round-the-clock patrols. At the same time, cargo trucks at the port and shipping containers will undergo enhanced inspections. With this policy in place, things won't be good for Eric, as the port is a crucial route for his human trafficking operations. After dealing with the matters at the police station, Vic goes to Dr. Kim's place to claim Jesse's body. He respects her final wish and throws Jesse's body into the sea. This action is indeed confusing. In case the virus infects marine life and then gets consumed by humans, what will happen? Vic hasn't considered this hidden danger, as the rate of his body's decay has accelerated and his vision has been affected. Most importantly, Vic is unable to restrain his cannibalistic desires. He almost couldn't resist harming his wife. Meanwhile, Max always feels like Vic is hiding something. So one day, while they are on a mission at the police station, he privately calls Vic a sigh. Six feet tall, physically strong. Which police officers would provide such an ambiguous testimony? Max believes Vic is still troubled by Issa's incident and intentionally conceals the killer's description. Vic can hold back his anger when he hears this. You stole my wife, and now you want to tarnish my professional career. Their argument intensifies, and Max pins Vic down on a shipping container. He said you're not worthy of Issa. Vic starts beating up Max. The violent factor within him is on the verge of losing control. Vic quickly moves away from Max to prevent a catastrophe. On the other side, after Jesse's death, Dr. Kim lost his experimental subject. In order to continue studying the virus, he initially planned to inject toxins into an elderly woman. However, she died of heart failure. Dr. Kim can only preserve the body in a glass cabinet. He must quickly find another replacement. One day, Dr. Kim is having dinner with his wife and children. Mrs. Kim suddenly mentions she encountered a homeless man in the morning. He had neither family nor friends. He seemed incredibly pitiful. 
She wanted to help him within her means. Dr. Kim immediately became interested. A homeless man with no social connections, isn't it just a substitute for having it delivered to your door? He asked his wife to invite the homeless man for dinner. Mrs. Kim had no suspicions, and the next day, she called the homeless man to their home. She even prepared a sumptuous meal to entertain him. The homeless man was very grateful, but Dr. Kim kept asking strange questions. One moment he asked about his family medical history, and the next moment he asked if he had taken any medication recently. The homeless man answers one by one. His health is fine. After Dr. Kim gets the answers he wanted, he gets up and pours a glass of wine for the homeless man. After the homeless man drinks it for a while, he starts feeling dizzy. Dr. Kim asks his wife to take their daughter to rest. He assures her that he will take care of their guest. Mrs. Kim thinks her husband is a doctor, so she doesn't suspect his intentions. After escorting their daughter to her womb, she curiously peeks over the railing. She discovers her husband takes the homeless man into the locked laboratory. Shortly after, the homeless man regains consciousness, realizing he's tied to the operating table. Dr. Kim approaches with a virus syringe and injects the toxin into the homeless man's arm. On the other side, Big encounters a new problem. His eldest son, Colin, has reached the rebellious stage. He found a girlfriend and developed a habit of stealing. He and his friends break into elderly people's homes to steal, and he gave his girlfriend a stolen brooch as a gift. Fortunately, Colin isn't inherently bad. A few days ago, he saw a video of the homeowner searching for the brooch. He learned it, that it was the relic of his wife. He wanted to return the brooch. Unexpectedly, he was caught red-handed by the landlord. He also found Colin's parents, Dick being a police officer's, cannot tolerate his son's theft, and blames his girlfriend for influencing him. But Colin is also angry, said you didn't care about me at all, now come to restrain me again. He says he wishes his mom had left Vic earlier. This statement completely infuriates Vic. His veins bulge on his face. He grabs his son and pushes him towards the wall. Fortunately, Isa intervenes in time, preventing Vic from causing a serious incident. He realizes that Max was right. If things continue like this, he will eventually destroy his family. Vic signs the divorce agreement, deciding to set Isa free. Inside a commercial building, a woman is about to go to work. She realizes her access card is not working. She went to the front desk to solve the problem. The man in front of her remains silent. The woman takes a closer look and realizes it's a dead body. She immediately calls the police. Helen carefully observes the peculiar corpse, noticing the well-dressed man wearing orange sports shoes. Helen suddenly realizes what Vic said the night he lost his gun, witnessed a murder on the bridge, and specifically pointed out the victim wearing orange running shoes. Helen immediately instructs her subordinates to contact Vic, but to her surprise, he is unreachable. Even Isa doesn't know Vic's whereabouts, and she said her husband was absconding. Upon hearing this, what does on the run out of fear mean? Colin pulls down his sweater, revealing the shocking bruises on his neck. Causing harm to a minor is indeed a crime. At this moment, Vic is hiding in the refrigerated compartment of a fishing boat. His body's decomposition is severe, making it impossible for him to face others. Just then, footsteps can be heard from above. Vic peeks out to sea and realizes it's Helen who has come looking for him. He covers his pale face with a whole idea. Then he turns off the cabin lights. Vic, with his back facing Helen, prepares tea. His vision is extremely poor now. He pours the hot water directly onto his hand. Helen is startled. She was about to turn on the lights, but Vic rushes over to stop her. He lies, claiming to have a skin disease. Don't want anyone to see the rash on my face. Although Helen finds it strange, she doesn't pursue further questioning. She shows the building's surveillance footage of the sculpture to Vic. In the footage, the masked figure is pushing a wooden crate towards the reception. After arranging the dead sculpture inside, he provocatively looks at the camera. Helen decides to hand over the case to Vic. After all, he was the first witness. Meanwhile, Dr. Jin deceives his wife, and the homeless man has already left. Mrs. Jin doesn't say anything outwardly, but suspicion has already taken root in her heart. Shortly after, Vic calls Dr. Jin, inquiring about the progress of his virus research. He can't barely contain his bloodlust. Dr. Jin advises Vic to find a way to replenish his supply of living cells. Vic hands up the phone, he uses a bottle of foundation to cover the corpse blemishes, and then goes to the morgue of the police station. Vic tries to distract the medical examiner. He opened the corpse cabinet. This is the only way he can replenish his supply of human flesh. The medical examiner notices something amiss while cleaning in the afternoon. There's a piece of shredded meat hanging in the crack of the cabinet. 
he forcefully opens the body storage unit, he discovers that someone has gnawed the body into pieces. On the other side, they can Max, go to to investigate the deceased's former residence. The owner of the orange running shoes paid the rent automatically with a bank card. There are no family photos in the house. The social connections are practically non-existent. So, during the months he was missing, no one reported to the police station. Vic deduces from this, the target chosen by the, this is the kind of person who dies without anyone finding out. Furthermore, the killer is highly likely to strike again, as he is extremely proud of his methods. That's why he displays the bodies like sculptures. Even the mask pattern he uses is taken from the works of Belgian painter Enser. Killers who enjoy grabbing attention like this are almost always serial killers. After hearing Vic's reasoning, he couldn't help but exclaim, as expected, monsters still understand monsters. After wrapping up the morning investigation, Vic arranges to meet his wife at the restaurant. The reason is that Issa received a bill from the hospital, indicating that Vic had undergone a brain scan. You see, Vic's father almost lost his life due to a brain tumor, and came close to losing his life. That's why Issa wants to know if Vic is okay, but Vic keeps changing the subject. Hey. Seeing Vic about to lose control, Issa immediately takes out a document, demanding him to give up custody rights of their child. If Vic wants to see his child, he must attend anger management classes. Vic becomes even more unable to control his emotions. He pushes Issa aside and runs to the seaside to vomit. Looks like Vic can't digest dead human flesh. He needs to replenish living cells. Issa becomes more concerned about Vic's health. Meanwhile, Mrs. Jin retrieves the laboratory key and enters her husband's secret base. She sees a homeless man lying on the operating table. Mrs. Jin approaches, wanting to see if he is dead. Unexpectedly, the homeless man suddenly rises. Frightening her, she immediately flees the laboratory. Meanwhile, Dr. Jin returns home. He immediately notices that the key's position has been tampered with. He immediately goes to the laboratory to check. Has someone been in here? No. Dr. Jin grabs the homeless man's wrist and realizes he still has a heartbeat, which means the virus has not produced the expected effect. Does it have to wait until he dies for it to take effect? Dr. Jin immediately uses a rope to strangle the homeless man until he stops breathing. On the other side, the autopsy report for the dead body sculpture is out. According to the report, the body had been submerged in a chemical solution for dehydration. All the fluids and fats in his body have been replaced by a silicone mixture. The killer definitely possesses professional knowledge in chemical processes and is also an expert in anatomy. At that moment, Vic appears. The forensic examiner notices a slight change in his expression, but doesn't expose Vic's act of cannibalizing the corpse. The examiner takes out the victim's coat and finds a label inside that reads Still Life No. 5. As Vic claimed, the killer indeed treats the victims as their artworks. Vic returns to the gallery once again. He stares blankly at Insel's painting. The mask used by the killer is in the corner of the painting. Vic becomes increasingly lost in thought. A young boy notices his strange expression and approaches to observe. Suddenly, an alarm sounds in the gallery, followed by someone hacking into the computer, repeatedly playing surveillance footage of the victim's last moments. Pixie, we you didn't need seen. What does this sentence mean? In fact, Dr. Jin has a little-known past. It came from poverty, depend on each other with mother. His mother worked tirelessly to provide for his education. Without socializing or friends, she only knew how to work hard. She was like an invisible person in this world. No one cared about her existence. Until her death, she never received societal respect. Since then, Dr. Jin made a firm decision. He wants to bring these invisible people into the sunlight. to her mother. That's Dr. Jin's motive for the crimes. He wants the public to see these marginalized individuals. At this moment, Dr. Jin lies in bed unable to sleep. Tell me, dear, have you been in the lab? Mrs. Jin desperately tries to ignore her racing heart. She denies ever going to the laboratory. Fortunately, Dr. Jin doesn't press further. Meanwhile, Vic's little daughter misses her father greatly. On that day, she deliberately ditched her brother, allowing the pet dog to sniff her father's coat. The little girl follows the dog, 
and discovers her father's hiding spot on a fishing boat. However, Vic is afraid of hurting his daughter, so he quickly blocks the door to keep her away. Vic is unable to control his emotions. His roar frightens his daughter. The little girl pushes her cart and returns home. Little did she know that shortly after she left, she was stopped by a car, and the person in the car is Eric. In a certain senior apartment building, the mailman is preparing to deliver mail to a particular household, but there's no response when he knocks on the door. He looks through the window and sees an old lady sitting on the couch. But no matter how the mailman knocks on the window, the old lady doesn't react. After Max and the police received the information, they quickly traced it back to Dr. Din, because the deceased had received help from the doctor before. After Mrs. Jin saw the photo, she immediately recognized the old lady. She told Max that this woman would come every week, come to the charity established by my husband to collect supplies. Max wanted to inquire further, but Dr. Din, who was nearby, sent him away. Shortly after, the police found another tragically dead body in a funeral home. He was stuffed inside a coffin of a deceased old lady. It was like being bitten by a wild beast during life. The family wanted to open the coffin and lay flowers for the old lady one last time before cremation. This male body would have been incinerated and completely destroyed. Max checked the funeral home's work roster and discovered that Eric's subordinate, Matt, worked there. Meanwhile, Mrs. Jin became increasingly afraid of her husband, as he had developed murderous intentions. Just as Dr. Jin was about to harm his wife, Mrs. Jin suddenly spoke up and admitted that she had been to the basement and had seen the trapped homeless man, but she wouldn't tell anyone about Dr. Jin's secret. On the contrary, she was willing to offer assistance. Mrs. Jin told her husband, I believe in your research is about creating great value. Dr. Jin didn't expect his wife to acknowledge his achievements, so he abandoned his decision to cure her, and instead led her to the basement. The homeless man at that moment, as the virus hadn't taken effect, had already lost vital signs. They both submerged the body in a soaking liquid. On the other side, Isa received a call from the school, and learned that her daughter hadn't attended class. She went to the dock to find Vic, but to her surprise, she was not unconscious as soon as she entered the cabin. When she regained consciousness, she found herself tied to an iron frame, and Vic revealed his true identity. He restrained himself with iron chains to prevent losing control, and proceeded to explain the details of the infection to Isa. However, Isa refused to believe. Vic reached out his hand to Isa. You're a nurse, after all. Check my pulse, and you'll know if I'm lying. Isa placed her hand on Vic's wrist, and astonishingly, she couldn't feel any pulse. At that moment, footsteps could be heard from above the cabin. Isa quickly shouted for help. While Vic went out to investigate, he discovered that the person approaching was Eric, who presented a photo of Vic's daughter, threatening Vic to assist him. Eric's cargo ship will arrive at the harbor tonight, and he wants Vic to find a way to evade the police and safely deliver the goods to the warehouse. After Eric leaves, Vic confesses to his wife about his predicament, that he had been hiding it from the police and had been taking money from Eric and then he helped the prostitute Amanda, because when Vic shot a criminal five years ago, the bullet went through the criminal and hit a little girl passing by, leaving her in a vegetative state. The girl's mother was the prostitute. Vic used all the money he obtained from Eric to financially support the girl's rehabilitation treatment. It was then that Isa understood her husband's secret. Vic assured his wife that he would save their daughter. Later, he went to the Red Line District to meet Amanda, as Eric frequently visited the prostitutes, so Vic wanted to gather information from her. However, Amanda said she hadn't seen Eric in a long time. Vic didn't suspect anything and quickly left. He didn't know his daughter was being hidden in Amanda's house. Shortly after Vic left, he realized he was being followed. The person following him was Eric's henchman, Muck. Mac saw Vic getting out of the car and hurriedly followed him into a bridge tunnel. But in the blink of an eye, Vic disappeared. While Muck was puzzled, Vic grabbed his neck and demanded to know where Mac had hidden his daughter. Gradually, anger turned into hunger. Vic bit into Mac's neck. Mac covered his wound and pulled out a gun, which snapped Vic back to his senses. Mac didn't dare to stay and quickly fled. He ran back to Eric's hideout, pleading with him to turn him into a vampire. But Eric would never allow someone to share eternal life. He blew Mac's head off. That night, the important cargo arrived at the dock. Max and Vic were tasked with inspecting the dock. They quickly discovered that the containers were filled with illegal immigrants. Max was about to rush in for an arrest, but he was knocked up by Vic from behind. Vic, in order to protect his daughter, escorted the group of refugees to safety. 
When Max regained consciousness, the majority of the refugees had already evacuated. He heard strange noises nearby, so he approached with his gun raised to investigate. He happened to stumble upon Eric feeding on someone. Max immediately opened fire, but Eric was completely unaffected by the bullets. Max had no choice but to flee. He climbed to the top of a container to hide, and unexpectedly overheard Eric's conversation with Vic. I have done as you instructed. Now release my daughter immediately. But Eric went back on his word, and enraged Vic immediately entered combat mode. Suddenly, the police arrived, forcing both of them to escape separately. Eric had no intention of letting Vic go. He quickly found the small boat where Vic was hiding, but unexpectedly fell into Vic's ambush. Because Vic's daughter was still in Eric's possession, Vic can kill him directly. He first subdued Eric, and Vic's ambush on Max has raised suspicion among the police, so he couldn't stay at the dock. Instead, he decided to take Eric and find Dr. Din. Eric kept struggling along the way. Vic crashed into a roadblock and immediately lost consciousness. By the time he woke up, Eric was already gone. Seeing the police about together, Vic quickly put on a hat and left. He fled to Dr. Jin's house, but unexpectedly, Max had also come looking for him, because Issa mentioned that Vic had undergone a brain scan at the hospital. Upon investigation, Max found out that the person in charge of the scan was Dr. Din, who was involved in the wax figure case of the old lady. Many suspicions pointed to this strange man, but Max couldn't get any information about Vic from him, because doctors are required to keep patient information confidential, unless Max obtained a search warrant. Otherwise, Dr. Jin wouldn't say anything. After sending Max away, he returned to the back room to check on Vic. Vic was severely injured. If life cells weren't replenished in time, the wound would rot completely. Dr. Jin didn't have a test subject at the moment and couldn't think of a way to help Vic. After hesitating for a moment, he unbuttoned his collar. He wants Vic to bite him. The tangy sweet blood almost drove Vic to lose control. But at the critical moment, he pushed the doctor away and fled in despair. Regardless of the changes happening in his body, Vic wanted to uphold the human moral line. If he couldn't control his instincts, what would differentiate him from a wild beast? However, the immediate problem still needed to be solved. Vic found his dying father, who was affected by a brain tumor, and had lost his vision. His father wanted to see the sunrise one last time before he died. Vic approached his father. <laughs> took his hand and placed it over the bullet hole in his chest. He confessed everything and gave his father a chance to make a choice. Later, the father and son arrived at the seaside. With his father's consent, Vic transformed him, and the gushing blood rejuvenated Vic's vitality. Miraculously, the father regained his eyesight and saw the sea and the sunrise. The two of them Saturday by the seaside until late at night. The old man was content with his life, so he took hold of his son's hand, placed the barrel against his own temple. And after a gunshot ran out, Vic took out his phone, clicking on the photo of the daughter sent by Eric. It was only now that he noticed the person was holding Amanda's daughter's doll in their arms. It turns out Eric had hidden the person in the red light district. At the same time, Amanda received a phone call. Eric instructed her to prepare the person. However, Amanda didn't want to harm the innocent girl, so she quickly woke up Vic's daughter. Footsteps could be heard outside the door. Amanda took the girl and hid under the bed. In the next moment, the bedroom door was forcefully opened. The first person to arrive at the scene was Vic. By the time Eric arrived, he only saw Dr. Jin sitting on the bed. Before he could react, Vic attacked him from behind. Both of them intended to use Eric as the next research subject. Dr. Jin took Eric away. Vic went home to visit his daughter. He stood outside the window, watching the mother and daughter, without disturbing them. Just as Vic was about to turn around and leave, he unexpectedly came face to face with Max. It turns out that a few hours ago, received information from the hospital, and learned that Vic had taken his father away. They immediately started searching for Vic based on surveillance clues. Eventually, they found Vic's father's body at the seaside. Max concluded, based on the bite marks on the deceased, that Vic was the cannibal. At the same time, Vic's eldest son got into trouble again. Not long ago, Colin followed his girlfriend to a nearby farm to steal things. He entered the farmhouse and discovered a new human sculpture. Afraid of getting into trouble, several young people quickly left the farm. Colin decided to make an anonymous report to the police station. However, just after he sent the email, he received a text message from his girlfriend, informing him that everyone was planning to set the farm on fire. 
Colin quickly contacted his girlfriend, hoping she would leave before the police arrived. Unfortunately, his girlfriend's phone was switched off. Colin hurriedly went to the scene to stop his girlfriend, but as soon as he arrived, he heard the sound of police sirens nearby. The group of young people immediately fled, setting fire to the farm owner's sculpture before leaving. Colin wanted to use his clothes to extinguish the fire, but the flames burned off the label on the sculpture's clothes. Based on the new miracle sequence on the label, it seemed that the farm owner was Dr. Jin's first creation. In the end, Colin failed to put out the fire and missed the opportunity to escape. He was caught by the police. The farm owner had neither family nor friends. Her only companion to talk to was the ostrich on the farm, so Dr. Jin targeted her early on. One night, the ostrich suddenly went crazy, constantly banging on the wooden door. The farm owner thought it was hungry, so she poured a heap of feed into the trough. She even reached into the gap to soothe the ostrich. Unexpectedly, the docile pet actually bit her hand. The ostrich's madness became increasingly severe. The farm owner had no choice but to put it down. She was immersed in grief and couldn't free herself. But Dr. Din, hiding in the shadows, killed her. Dr. Jin dragged the body back to the laboratory for safekeeping. The place where the farm owner was bitten had already been infected with an unknown virus. Moreover, when this substance reacted with the soaking liquid, it produced a real zombie virus and seeped into the ground through pipe gaps. At this moment, Dr. Jin accidentally knocked over a magazine and the falling bullet soaked in the toxic water. We know what happened next. That bullet pierced Vic's heart, making him the first infected mutant. The story returns to the present. Colin, who had no suspicion, was quickly released, while Max escorted Vic to see Dr. Din, demanding that both of them confess everything. When Max woke up, he found himself locked in the basement, and Eric was also in a nearby iron cage. Vic had no intention of harming Max. He took out the other party's mobile phone and recorded all his experiences and handed over evidence of his past collusion with Eric. Vic was willing to admit his actions, but on the condition that he had to capture the masked person who shot him on the bridge. So Vic pleaded with Max for a few days of leniency. Max agreed to cooperate. Unfortunately, the two of them didn't know yet that the real mastermind was standing right beside them. Dr. Jin escorted the two away and then confirmed Eric's sample results. The virus inside him was the same as Vic's. Dr. Jin couldn't understand why the homeless man injected with the virus didn't undergo successful transformation. He rolled up his sleeves and asked Eric to bite him, but Eric refused to cooperate. Eric was puzzled. Don't you have the virus in your hands? Inject it directly into your body and wait for three or four days. It naturally mutates. Dr. Jin's face changed dramatically upon hearing this, so the experiment on the homeless man didn't fail. It just hadn't reached the time of mutation yet, but the homeless man had already been turned into a statue by Dr. Jin. Now it was too late for anything to make up for this mistake. Dr. Jin took a vial of virus extract and left the basement. He broke into the home of an elderly person who was alone to conduct another experiment. Unexpectedly, the doorbell rang. It turned out to be a neighbor who saw the recent news and was worried about the elderly man being alone at home. So they came specifically to check on him. Dr. Jin had no choice but to temporarily return home. But as soon as he entered the underground laboratory, he discovered that Eric was missing. His wife's body was lying there with a bullet hole on her head. Clearly, Eric had shot her to prevent her from mutating. It turned out that shortly after Dr. Jin left, his wife had intended to secretly release Eric. She had cooperated with her husband before, but she only wanted to save her own life and didn't want to see more people being killed. However, Eric ended up biting and killing Mrs. Din. Now, he stood behind Dr. Din and swallowed the last vial of virus extract. An enraged Dr. Din picked up a handgun and started shooting. Eric, concerned about not wearing a helmet, could only escape the basement for now. Shortly after, Vic came to find the doctor, only to discover his wife's gruesome death. Dr. Jin put on a mournful expression, hoping that Vic would allow him to draw another sample of blood to extract the virus. Meanwhile, Amanda received a phone call from Eric. To her surprise, she could hear her daughter's voice on the other end. You must know that since the other party became a vegetative state, her hasn't spoken for more than 10 years. Amanda was extremely excited. Eric took advantage of the situation and threatened. Hurry and bring Vic to see me. Otherwise, you won't be able to reunite with your daughter. Amanda could only contact Vic. The two of them arrived at the address Eric provided. They pushed open the warehouse door and discovered that it was where Eric stored food. 
At this time, Alice, who has been infected, is chewing on the dead body. Amanda, disregarding the danger, rushed into the iron cage. Dick followed, intending to take them both out. Unexpectedly, Eric appeared and locked the three of them inside. The frenzied girl was about to devour her mother. They quickly separated the two of them. At that moment, police sirens could be heard outside. There was no way Vic could have appeared alone. He had already contacted Max before setting out. Eric rushed out of the factory. Unexpectedly, Max and his men blocked his path. Eric was shot multiple times and collapsed to the ground. His helmet fell off his head. Unyielding, he crawled up and dashed towards the sea. On the other side, Vic, in order to save Alice, surprisingly handed her over to Dr. Din. This was truly sending the lamb into the tiger's mouth. Dr. Jin falsely claimed to have developed a vaccine and took the opportunity to return to the laboratory. It took out the virus extract and injected it, and then appeared wearing a mask. Vic approached and removed his mask. It was only then that they realized the mastermind was Dr. Din, but he didn't notice the smile on the other person's face. Amanda, who was standing aside, knew that her daughter could no longer be cured. She couldn't let her beloved child become a monster, so she cued her daughter with her own hands. Meanwhile, Vic followed Max to the seaside, prepared to accept his fate of death. Little did he know, after receiving the virus injection, Dr. Din, who was shot in the heart with a handgun, had already met the conditions for mutation. Just as Vic was about to pull the trigger, he suddenly says something unexpected, and the first season ends here. Although it's a lesser-known Belgian zombie series, it is unexpectedly thrilling, with a unique storyline and tightly paced plot, with no dragging or unnecessary elements. Dr. Kim is a master of giving ideas. He committed suicide for the sake of mutation. The police and Vic would probably still be in the dark. If you enjoy my channel, please give me a subscription.